welcome the first of our presenters today, Jeffrey Tyrell. Um, like to come on up and he will be presenting um, a talk titled The Necessary Split of Counterterrorism. And after he speaks, we'll also invite um, his advisor here, Matt Clemens, up to say a couple words and, and, and grant him his honor still for completing the program. And there'll also be time after each speaker for a short QA. So thank you so much. Hi, I'm Jeff Patil, and I'm going to present, be presenting the necessary split of counterterrorism. So, what is terrorism? Terrorism is the manipulation of fear to exert control over other humans in order to achieve some political or social goal. Uh, this definition is widely debated and not universally applied, as terrorism can take on many forms, whether that's from governments or anarchists. But why do I want to discuss? Terrorism. Well, terrorism is becoming more and more prevalent in our lives, uh, not just because the number of terrorist attacks are increasing, however, their deadliness is increasing, as well as media coverage uh, of these attacks. As you can see in a three year period, uh, there were roughly 4,000 attacks globally, and that's uh, up until October 2019, so it does not include all of um, so there are a number of terrorist attacks, and in the U.S. alone, there were 620 terrorist attacks in a 21-year period from 1995 to 2016. But the majority of our current counterterrorism practice is based off of one of those attacks, 9/11. 9/11 accounts for nearly 86 percent of those 3,400 deaths uh, during that 21-year period. So it's understandable why we may see. Uh, the kind of counterterrorism reaction in the United States that we do to the radical Islamic terrorists. Um, however, my argument is that the threat is not coming from radical Islamic terrorists. So, over the next many minutes here, uh, I'll argue that the threat is coming from right wing extremists and not radical Islamic terrorists. Not only is the threat coming from domestic right wing extremists, but right-wing extremists and radical Islamists take up are very different types of terrorism and people. Therefore, the U.S. needs a more focused counterterrorism group to handle our domestic terrorism issues, especially when we examine the supply factors, the difference in supply factors um, in domestic versus international terrorism. So in my thesis, I stated when we examine the difference in supply factors. So what are those supply factors? In order to identify these differences among domestic and international terror, radical Islamic terror, far right and extremist terror, um, I outline three supply factors of money, accessibility to targets, and people, or membership. These supply factors, as a supply, essentially enable a terrorist group to accomplish their goals, um, carry out their mission of creating some political or social change. Now, the purpose, as I stated, of identifying these supply factors is in part to identify major differences among international radical Islamic terrorism and domestic far right wing extremism. When we look at international terror, um, we look at their finances more often than not. In international terror, you need a significant uh, sum of resources to commit the acts you're looking to commit. You need propaganda uh, to acquire membership, you need weapons, allies, transportation. You have a ton of costs associated with acquiring all of those things as a clandestine operation. When you look at targets of international terrorist groups, you see that uh, international terrorists are going to target politically significant or socially significant things. Especially when we look at the United States, international terrorists are going to target government buildings or symbols of U.S. power and influence um, as they're trying to make some point, they're trying to make some change. And to do so, you need to make a large statement. Lastly, if you look at people, um, an international terrorist group needs people in order for the group to survive. Uh, they have a very zealous message that you need a large number of people to continue on and to uh, commit the attacks. The more people you have, the more planning you can do, the more uh, campaigns you can carry out. 
as I mentioned, most of the terrorism in the world uh, happens outside of the United States, typically in the Middle East. So that's where you see most of these attacks occurring. So we don't necessarily see all of the things that groups such as ISIS do day to day because they're not committing all those attacks in the U.S. However, people are vitally important to a continuation of terrorist attacks. Now, when we look at domestic uh, terrorism, the far right wing extremists, we see a completely different story in all three supply factors. Financially, domestic right wing extremists do not need a lot of resources. They don't have allies statistically. They don't need large grade weapons or access to, let's say, airplanes. Um, their targets are also completely different than what you would see in international terror. Uh, targets of radical Islamic terrorists, as I said, are trying to make a political goal, where the far right wing extremists are defending what they think is their political uh, spheres. They're not attacking government buildings or symbols of US influence. Um, they're attacking their everyday uh, locations. And then people involved in domestic terrorism typically involve one person committing an act. Uh, often referred to in our popular culture, popular media, as lone gunmen, um, shooters, uh, you know, far right wing extremists. I call them all terrorists um, in my paper. Uh, so we look at all these supply factors, and one common trend that we can identify as being vitally important to attacks, in my argument, is people. It's people as the most important supply factor to terrorism, solely because you see the prevalence of someone's beliefs in both uh, domestic and international terrorism. Now, these figures, uh, these figures here summarize terrorism post 9 11 up until 2016. As you can see, uh, far right wing extremists commit far more attacks than radical Islamic terrorists. Um, this is solely based on number of attacks, not deaths or destruction, uh, planning, or anything of that sort. This is just the number of terrorism events. So, Per my argument, the threat is coming from uh, far right wing extremists, and the number of attacks, attacks shows that similar trend. Now, this is a little more descriptive of what's actually happening. Using the same exact data, um, on the bottom half of this chart, you see the far right wing extremist attack frequency in light blue, uh, so the number of attacks they're committing. And then in dark blue, we have radical monitoring. On the top half, which we didn't see before, is the number of fatalities. The fatalities are vitally important, as I said, the US based most of its current counterterrorism on the fact that one attack on 9 11 contributed to 86% of death due to terrorism in a 21 year period. So, fatalities are not to be ignored, neither is the threat coming from 9 11 terror. However, the frequency of attacks um, coming from the far right are not to be ignored either. So what are we currently doing to fight terrorism? As I mentioned, the majority of our current counterterrorism is built around a uh, premise of a 9-11 style attack. So as I just said as well, I don't want to detract from the international counterterrorism focus. I do find it very important to protect the nation um, from any wrong, uh, from any attacks, whether it's governments or anarchists around the globe. I do think we need to supplement that with a more uh, domestic focus on the far right wing extremists. So currently, the US increased counterterrorism spending 16 fold post 9-11. So from 2002 to 2017, the United States spent $2.3 trillion on counterterrorism. That includes a wide range of activities, but a lot of the uh, money included in that goes to the things I'm going to talk about in just a second. The $2.3 trillion uh, spending between 2002 and 2017 comes out to roughly $175 billion a year, which is an incredible sum. Uh, a lot of that resource, uh, a lot of those resources were devoted to overseas troops as well as bombing campaigns. They all carried out the mission of uh, what, what we're doing here to fight counterterrorism. To prevent counterterrorism, to prevent terrorists from attacking targets, uh, the United States protects government buildings, the uh, United States protects large cities, the United States protects against, uh, protects against any air traffic that may uh, make our cities and our government buildings vulnerable, as well as protecting 
targets such as the president and key members of Congress um, through like Secret Service protection and other physical measures that they take. Uh, to identify and stop international terrorists, the United States employs a variety of methods. Um, as you've probably seen in the news uh, over the last many years, we actively hunt out terrorists. Uh, leadership decapitation is something that's a key focus of uh, counterterrorism. Uh, when Al Baghdadi was assassinated by the United States government, uh, it was thought that bringing down the leader of an organization will end that organization. Um, so that's one key strategy. Another key strategy is to find participants of terrorist groups as uh, you know that are in the United States, whether they have traveled here, whether they are citizens here, whatever it may be. But the FBI and Homeland Security will find participants of these organizations, people that may have been uh, influenced by terrorist propaganda and whatever else they may be involved with. Um, terrorists themselves have access to the resources, and they will either watch them closely or take away their resources. Even having a simple conversation with them has been shown to reduce the chance that they will actually commit a terrorist attack. So there's a lot of resources devoted to finding and eliminating people that can actually commit these terrorist attacks. Lastly, we look at terrorist finances. This is probably one of the most widely researched areas of terrorist uh, operations from what I've gathered in my own research. Uh, you have attacks constantly being carried out on the uh, availability of resources for terrorist organizations, such as oil, refineries, trade routes, um, smuggling routes, whatever it may be, how a terrorist organization overseas is going to fund their operations, going to fund all the things that need uh, to commit an act. The U.S. goes after those assets uh, very, very aggressively. However, we then look at domestic terrorism. And as I outlined before, these spot factors are very different. So when we look at domestic terrorist targets, we can't possibly protect all the targets of a domestic terrorist. We can't protect every Walmart in the United States. We can't protect every school, every church. We can't protect things that we do in everyday lives with the same resources we do on government buildings like the White House, there was only one of them. Um, and big cities where we control all the air traffic around them. It's a very different approach. Um, when we look at the financial resources of domestic terrorists, we see that they're not using the same volume of uh, money or uh, cash to commit any transactions throughout the planning stages or even the act. So we don't, we can't target that. Our current counterterrorism revolving around far right wing extremist terror is really minimal, if anything. Um, my argument is that we need to increase our scope of counterterrorism to really dive into who's committing these attacks and how we can stop them, as we do with international and Islamic terrorists. So this uh, heat map I find very revealing about kind of all the points I've talked about. The purple uh, dots are radical Islamic terror, and it's important to note that the, the size of the bubble is the size of scale of the attack based on fatalities. So you see a much larger um, scale attack from radical Islamic terrorists based around big metropolitan areas um, along our coastline, which is where more people are concentrated, more resources, and more uh, U.S. assets. Uh, whereas the far right wing extremist has smaller attacks, but far more and no discernible pattern as to where they are actually going to attack. So what do we do going forward? This is an extremely difficult question that I'm not sure I can fully answer. Um, however, I think there's a couple things that need to happen. Um, number one, there needs to be a necessary distinction among law enforcement personnel, anyone operating with uh, that authority, that there's a difference between the far right wing extremist terror and uh, radical Islamic terror. Um, second, I think, and probably most difficultly, we have to use political offices to promote unity of Americans as the far right wing extremist ideology typically tries to isolate uh, white uh, race from other minorities as well as um, just American values, even though an American is not defined by race or religion. Um, that's their beliefs. And we have a lot of people
people in leadership positions uh, that will influence these thoughts or not uh, publicly deny these thoughts as being uh, a valid point. Uh, another thing that we need to focus on politically is our, our prison population disparities. They give a very misleading idea of uh, the actual crime statistics in our country. Uh, this is much easier to actually address when we look at the disproportionate um, incarceration of minorities in our country. Not only do we have the largest prison population in the world, but we have uh, disproportionately minorities in our prisons, and they don't, they have not been shown to be crimes more often than white people. Uh, to do some of this, we need to provide resources for law enforcement. This can be federal and local. I think we need to provide resources for local law enforcement to interact um, with people who have uh, committed, uh, with people who have outspoken, who have uh, spoken out about their beliefs, who have uh, made it a point to publish a manifesto or join hate groups. We need to make sure that these specific people have the right to speak out, but do not have the right to then access weapons or uh, the possibility to, to hurt people. Um, so that is going to be, that's a huge potential right there for local law enforcement actually find the people who need these, who need these acts or potential to commit these acts. Lastly, uh, and simply, we need to call domestic terrorists terrorists. Um, there's a huge response when we see a radical Islamic terrorist attack, such as the Boston Marathon bombers, who were U.S. citizens, but there's not as much of an attack, there's not as much of a response from the president, um, depending on, no matter who the president is, historically there's not as much of a response politically to say that these people are terrorists and we're going to prosecute them with our full justice system. Thank you. Are there any questions?